Hey Applied English, happy new week. I hope you guys had a great Martin Luther King Day yesterday. Uh, maybe a time to relax, maybe a time to catch up on some of the stuff from our first couple weeks of school. I know that's what yesterday was for me. Um, I do want to start off this lesson with prayer, um, and then we'll move through our agenda together. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for this country we live in. Um, we know that it's not perfect, but we thank you for days like yesterday, um, where we got to remember um, true heroes who worked um, who worked tirelessly to bring our nation together. And we pray, God, that you are equipping us to do the same kind of work um, through what we do at Milwaukee Lutheran High School. You're equipping us um, not just to bring um, people of different ethnicities and different walks of life together. We pray, God, that you're helping us to build um, just the skills that we need to lead successful futures, um, successful futures that are going to help us be prosperous, but also our families and also our communities, too. Um, let us work through that together, um, knowing that we are the church together, knowing that our church um, is to bring you glory and it's to spread um, just your gospel message for all the, the earth to hear. We pray, God, that we can follow Dr. King's example, not just calling out for justice and for unity, but also... Um, also um, calling for the entire world to know you as well. We love you, Jesus. We pray this all in your name. Amen. So our focus for today, for you guys to be able to read and comprehend a script and drama. From our drama terms last week, we covered that a script is a written copy of a play or a, or a film or a, or a TV episode. Um, I do have paper scripts for my students in class. I also have a digital copy of a script for us to look through today. That play is trifles. So by now, you've probably completed your trifles vocabulary assignment. If you haven't yet, please make sure you complete that first. Um, if you're not sure about those vocab words, again, I've given definitions in the directions video there. So please make sure you uh, complete that assignment. I'll grade those and get those back to you so you can study for next week's quiz. Right now, in person, my classes are um, acting through the first half of a play called Trifles by, Slu by Susan Glassville. It, when, you're, when you're in the audience or when you're virtual, I want you to answer the questions in your comprehension guide. So I'll show that in just a moment. And our next lesson looks pretty much identical to this one. Instead of vocab, we're looking at grammar with pronoun antecedent agreement. And we'll do the second half of Trifles because it is a pretty short play. Let's take a look at this play. Trifles part one. So it says, as you watch this video, please answer the comprehension questions attached below the video. For your convenience, I've also given you a copy of the script. What I'm going to do is actually look at these documents first, and then I'll pull open the video in YouTube for us to watch through together. At that point, I'll shut up. You won't be able to hear me at all. You'll be able to hear the video. At the end of the video, I think we'll look at some of the comprehension guide questions together. But let's take a look at these first. Notice that for these documents, um, if you click on the document itself, it will download. So if you have uh, Adobe Acrobat Reader and want to download, trifles you can uh, if you were in my B group last week I believe I gave you a printed copy of this play so you can use your printed copy instead or if you click view it'll open it up in a new tab notice it's a nine page document we'll be doing the first five pages today because page one is pretty short um, in the video we'll be watching it's a YouTube video it'll walk us through page five just 11 minutes or so something like that and we'll do the second half in our next lesson anyway. Trifles Comprehension Guide is a list of things. So I wanna look at each page of this, of this little document here. So the first two pages are just multiple choice. These are the comprehension questions themselves. I don't know what happened with the formatting. So I apologize for the weird formatting online there. This is not something that I will collect, um, but I am quizzing you over uh, these questions next week. So please make sure you're, you're completing this. You can use this comprehension guide on your quiz. Uh, the first two pages are just multiple choice. So where is the place set? What's the reason why Hale came to visit Mr. Wright? These are just comprehension questions based on the text itself. Once you get to page three, page four in this document, because the size is very strange. There we go. You'll get to a, a bit on irony there. All three types of irony exist in trifles. Incomplete sentences give one example of each type below. This will be something that we discuss as we get uh, to the end of the play. I think you'll see an extra credit question or two on your quiz about irony, but we'll discuss that next week as well. There's also part three, which is paragraph writing. This is one that we'll walk through as a class, uh, not this week, but next week. This paragraph will be one that I collect for a grade, so just keep that in mind. You'll see a separate assignment for this virtually, but if you want to start walking through this paragraph writing assignment, you can. This has to do with the theme and symbolism of the play, so we won't be able to answer it anyway until we get to the end. I highly recommend you leave this document over, or you leave this document open as you watch the first half of the play today. Once again, I'll look at some of these comprehension questions with you after we're done with the first half of the play. 
All right, and this is about the right spot right here. Um, if you are following along in your script, that's a great idea right here. One thing I've done to try to make this a little bit easier is I've put on the YouTube captions too. Now notice they're not perfect, and there's already some spelling mistakes and capitalization errors right here. But I hope that that'll at least help you follow along what's happening in this play. Once again, I also recommend you follow along in your um, comprehension questions. But again, I'll cover some of those uh, right after we watch the first half of this play as well. As we watch, pay close attention to the plot, what's going on, but also pay attention to the actors. See how they're capturing who their characters are. See how they're projecting their voices, enunciating their lines, following their cues on stage as well. And those of you who have me in class will be practicing this, practicing these same acting skills um, when you have me in class this week as well. Let's watch. It should be warmer inside. <sighs> This feels good. Step up to the fire, ladies. Oh, I'm not cold. Now, Mr. Hale, before we move things about, you explain to Mr. Henderson just what you saw when you came here yesterday morning. By the way, has anything been moved? Are things just as you left them yesterday? It's just the same. When I dropped below zero last night, I thought I'd better send Frank out this morning to make a fire for us. No use getting pneumonia with a big case on. But I told him not to touch anything except the stove. And you know Frank. Somebody should have been left here yesterday. Oh, yesterday. When I had to send Frank out to Morris Center for that man who went crazy, I want you to know I had my hands full yesterday. I knew you could get back from Omaha by today, and as long as I went over everything here myself. Well, Mr. Hale, tell just what happened when you came here yesterday morning. Well, Harry and I was headed to town with a load of potatoes. We come along the road from my place, and when we got here, I said, I'm going to go see if I can't get John Wright to go in with me on a party telephone. I spoke to Wright about it before, but he put me off, saying folks talk too much anyway, and all he asked was peace and quiet. I guess you know about how much he talked himself, but I thought maybe if I talked about it before his wife, though I said to Harry's I didn't know what his wife wanted made much difference to John. I wanted to pause there for just a moment just so I can identify characters for you. Um, so we have the county attorney right here. Notice that he's questioning Mr. Hale about something that happened yesterday. That's going to be an important point uh, in just a little bit here. This guy in the scarf is the sheriff. So he was the one who was on the scene yesterday. Clearly a crime has uh, taken place in this house. And then we have the two women. One is Hale's wife. This is Mrs. Hale right here. And this is Mrs. Peters right here. Mrs. Peters is the sheriff's wife. So sheriff's wife, Mrs. Peters. Uh, Mr. Hale's wife is this lady with the red hair as well. Um, the two women are going to be very, very important uh, coming up here soon. But just I want you to be able to identify who the characters are. Pay close attention to what Mr. Hale is saying here. He's going to cover some of the answers in your comprehension guide. I knew they must be up. It was past 8 o'clock, so I knocked again. And I thought I heard somebody say, come in. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure. I'm not sure yet, but I opened the door, this door, and there in that rocker sat Mrs. Wright. What was she doing? She was rocking back and forth. She had her apron in her hand and was kind of pleating at it. Mm -hmm. How'd she look? Well, she looked queer. How do you mean queer? Well, as if she didn't know what she's going to do next. It kind of done up. How did she seem to feel about your coming? I don't think she minded one way or another. She didn't pay much attention. I said, how do, Mrs. Wright? It's cold, ain't it? She said, is it? And just went on a plate at her apron. Well, I was surprised she didn't ask me to come up to the stove or to sit down, but just sat there rocking back and forth, not looking at me. So I said, I'd come to see if John wanted to put in a telephone. And then she laughed. Now, I guess you'd call it a laugh. Uh, I thought of Harry and the team outside, so I said a little sharp. Can't I see John? No, she said, kind of dull like. Why well, ain't he at home, says I. Yes, says she, he's at home. Well, then why can't I see him? I asked her out of patience. Because he's dead, says she. Dead, says I. She just nodded her head, not getting a bit excited, but rocking back and forth. Well, well where is he, I says. And not knowing what to say, she just pointed upstairs. Well, like that, I got up with the idea of going up there. I walked from there to here. And then I said, well, well what did he die of? He died of a rope around his neck, said she. Just went on a plate and her apron. Well, I thought I might need help. I went out and called Harry. We went upstairs, and there he was, just okay. a black. I, I think I'd rather you point that uh, upstairs when we get up there. 
Sorry about pausing that once again. I think this does give us a moment to go back and look at a comprehension question here. Want to make sure we're not getting lost in our guide. Let's take a look at number three. So we can finally get to kind of the big bombshell in this play's exposition. It's the reason why there's, a, there's an attorney and a sheriff and all these investigators there. What did Mrs. Wright tell Hale while he was at their house the day before? Well, let's look at the, the answers here. A, that she's afraid of telephones. I don't know about that. B, that her husband is dead. The answer right there. That's why they're, That's why there's a crime scene investigation in, in their house right now. It's not that the house is haunted or that she's very sick. Those are throwaway answers. We learn here that Mrs. Wright's husband is dead. Mr. Hale came to their house the day before just asking if, um, if uh, Mr. Wright would be interested in going in with him on a party telephone. That's buying a telephone together that they can share. Um, that kind of explains why, why the setting's a little bit different. But here we learn the big bombshell, boom, Mr. Wright is dead. This house is a crime scene, and we have a murder mystery of sorts right here. Notice that we have some more information to look for. Where is this place set? You can answer on your own. What was the reason that Hale had come to visit Mr. Wright? He wants to discuss sharing a party line for telephones. It sets us, once again, about 100 years in the past for now, as the telephone was a relatively new invention. You have some more uh, answers to look for as we watch today. I think you can answer through number... I think you can answer through number seven or eight um, as we work through today's, and the rest will be able to answer as we watch the second half later this week. Let's keep watching. Well, my first thought was to get that rope off. He looked up, but uh, Harry, he went up to him and he said, no, he's dead all right, and we'd better not touch anything. So we come back downstairs, and she was still sitting that same way. I said, is, uh, has anybody been notified, Mrs. Wright? No, she said, unconcerned. Well, now, who did this, Harry said uh, to Mrs. Wright. I don't know, she says. You don't know, says Harry. No, says she. Well, weren't you sleeping in the bed with him, says Harry? Yes, says she, but I was on the inside. You mean somebody put a rope around his neck and strangled him and you didn't wake up, Harry said? I didn't wake up, she said, after him. Well, we must have looked as if we didn't see how that could be, for, for after a minute, she said, I sleep sound. Well, Harry was going to ask her more questions, but... I said maybe we ought to let her tell her story first to the sheriff or the coroner. Mm -hmm. So Harry went fast as he could to River's place where there's a telephone. Okay, and what did Mrs. Wright do when she knew you'd gone for the coroner? Well, well, she moved from that chair to this one right here, and she just kind of sat there with her hands held together looking down. Mm -hmm. Now, I got the feeling that I ought to make some conversation, so I said I'd come to see if John wanted to put in a telephone. Then she laughed, then she stopped, and she looked at me scared. I don't know. Now, maybe it wasn't scared. I, I wouldn't like to say it was. But soon, Harry got back, and, and then Dr. Lloyd came, and, and then you, Mr. Peters. And I guess that's all I know, that you don't. Well, I guess we'll go upstairs and then out to the barn and around there. Uh, you're convinced there was nothing important to you? Nothing that would point to any motive? Nothing here but kitchen things. It did freeze. She worried about that when it grew so cold. She said her fire would go out and the jars would break. Well, can you beat the women? Help for murder and worrying about her preserves. Well, I guess before we're through, she may have something more important than preserves to worry about. Well, women are used to worrying over trifles. And yet, for all their troubles and worries, what will we do with our <coughs> ladies? Dirty towels. Not much of a housekeeper, would you say, ladies? There's a great deal of work to be done on a farm. Well, to be sure. And yet I know of some Dixon County farmhouses which do not have such roller towels. Well, those towels get dirty awful quick. Men's hands are not always as clean as they might be. <laughs> Loyal to your sex, I see. But you and Mrs. Wright were neighbors. I suppose you were friends, too. I have not seen much of her of late years. I've not been in this house in long why was that? You didn't like her? Oh, I liked her all well enough. Farmers' wives have got their hands full, Mr. Henderson, and then... Yes. Never seemed a very cheerful place. No, not cheerful. I shouldn't say she had the homemaking instinct. Well, I don't know, it's right, do you? You mean they didn't get on very well? No, I don't mean anything. I just... I don't think it plays to be any cheerful for John Wright to be. Uh, I'd like to talk about that later. 
I'm gonna go upstairs and get the light things up there. I suppose anything Mrs. Peters does will be all right. She was to take in some clothes for her, you know, and a few little things. We left in such a hurry yesterday. Yes, but I'd like to see what you take, Mrs. Peters, so I can keep an eye out for anything that might be of use to us. Yes, Mr. Peters. Just wanted to pause for a moment there. Um, notice the two lines that have been said about genders already today. First thing, uh, one of the men said that women are always worrying over trifles. That's a vocab word for us. A trifle is a small, unimportant thing. So kind of this generalization that that worry or that women kind of worry about these tiny little details that maybe aren't important. Keep that thought in the back of your head. It's going to be important for this play. The other thing that's been said about men, I think it was Mrs. Hale who said that men's hands are not always as clean as they seem. Uh, as the as the county attorney is is kind of criticizing how dirty the towels are in the Wrights house, that's going to be an important line later as well. So kind of keep those those lines in your head. Uh, notice what this play is saying about genders, about how uh, how women are and how men are. That's going to be important when we get to theme at the end of this play. Well, I would hate to have men coming into my kitchen snooping around and criticizing. Of course, it's no more than their duty. Duty's all right, but I guess that deputy sheriff that came out to make the fire he might have got a little of this on. We should have thought of that sooner. Seems mean to talk about her and not have a thing slipped up when she had to come home in such a hurry. She had bread set. Shame about her fruit. I wonder if it's all gone. No, I think maybe there's some left, Mrs. Peters. Look here, it's cherries, too. I declare, I believe it's the only one. She's going to feel awful bad after all the hard work and the hot weather. I remember the afternoon I put up my cherries. Well, I really must get those things from the front room closet. Are you coming with me, Mrs. Hale? You can help me carry them. It's cold in there. Right, it's close. I think maybe that's why she kept so much to herself. You know she didn't even belong to the lady's aid. I suppose she felt she couldn't do her part and then, well, you don't enjoy things when you feel shabby. She used to wear pretty clothes, be lively, back when she was Minnie Foster when the town girls sing in the choir. Oh my, that was 30 years ago. This all you was to take in. Well, she said she wanted an apron. Funny thing to want, because there isn't much to get you dirty in jail, goodness knows. She said it was in the top drawer of the cabinet. Yes, here it is. And the little shawl that always hung behind the door. Ah, yes, there it is. Mrs. Peters. Yes, Mrs. Hale. Do you think she did it? Oh, I don't know. Well, I don't think she did. Asking about her apron and her little shawl and worrying about her fruit? Mr. Peters says it oh, looks bad for her. Mr. Henderson can be awful sarcastic in his speech and he'll make fun of her saying she didn't wake up. Well, I guess John Wright didn't wake up when he slipped that rope under his neck. No, it's strange. They must have done it awful crafty and still. They say it's such a funny way to kill a man, making it all up like that. That's what Mr. Hale says. He says there was a gun in the house, and that's what he can't understand. Mr. Henderson said on the way over that what was needed for the case was a motive, something to show anger or sudden emotion. Well, I don't see any signs of anger around here. I wonder how the men are getting on the stairs. You know, it seems kind of sneaking. Locking her up and down and then coming in here and trying to get her own house to turn against her. But, Mrs. Hale, the law is the law. I suppose it is, Mr. Peters. You know, you better loosen up your things. You won't feel it when you go outside. She was a piece in a quilt. Oh, it's a love cavern pattern. It's pretty, ain't it? I wonder. Is she going to quilt it or just not? They wonder if she was going to quilt it or just knot it. <laughs> Frank's fire didn't do very much good up there, did it? Let's get out to the barn and get that cleared up. I don't see if there's anything so 
strange or taking up our time with little things or waiting for them to get the evidence on season or right? Sorry for the weird jump. I realized I went a little bit long on the play itself. We'll cover the second half in our next video. Let's talk through some of these comprehension questions because I realized that the closed captioning on the video is not great and it's easy to kind of miss some of the details as you're trying to follow along in the script. One thing I would note, if you are um, in my B group for fifth hour, you'll be able to, to act out some of these parts um, in your next lesson later on this week. Just keep that in mind. Today's kind of about comprehending what's going on in the play. We'll follow up with this as we act in class uh, in a couple days here. So number one, where is the play set? In the Wright family's farmhouse, in the county jail, in a courtroom, or in my classroom? The play is uh, very obviously set in the Wright family's farmhouse, specifically in the kitchen. So um, the set itself on the video is not wonderful, but notice that the play itself takes place in the farmhouse. The offstage parts would be like the, the upstairs area where the murder took place. Pretty much everything we see up on stage takes place in the kitchen. What was the reason that Hale had come to visit Mr. Wright? It's to discuss sharing a party line for telephones. Once again, that sets this play about 100 years ago. Uh, we know what Mrs. Wright told, uh, told Mr. Hale that her husband is dead. Obviously, she is, is the main suspect in that murder, so the investigators are trying to figure out if she's guilty or not. How was Mr. Wright murdered? I hope you caught this. Um, he was not shot in the head with a gun. One of the strange details is that there is a gun in the house, but it wasn't fired. Specifically, he was hung with a rope around his neck. So the question is, how did Mrs. Wright not notice that happening if she was in the bed with him? It's a good question. According to Mrs. Wright, why was she unaware of her husband's death? She slept in another bedroom? Nope. She was definitely in the same bed. Uh, she was at choir practice unusually late? Nope. She had been away visiting her mother? Nope. She sleeps very soundly is the claim that she makes. So she's claiming that she did not hear or see um, someone strangling her husband to death in the same room that she was sleeping in. It's kind of sus if you ask me. What does Henderson find on the top shelf of the cupboard closet? He does not find the rope. That would very obviously make her guilty. Um, not a knife, not a diary. Specifically, they find broken jars of preserves. It's like preserved fruit. So think jelly, but with actual pieces of fruit in it. Um, that would be an example of preserves. Specifically, these are broken. That's going to be important once we discuss theme and symbolism in another week here. We can get to seven. How, how does Mrs. Hale remember Minnie in her youth? Maybe this one was easy to miss. Specifically, Mrs. Hale remembers Minnie, that is Mrs. Wright, as being lively and pretty. So Minnie was a very different person um, in her youth as she is um, in the story of this play. She was known as being very lively, very energetic, very pretty as a young woman. Obviously not so much anymore. And then where is she as everyone's investigating her house? Notice that she's not on stage. Um, again, not at her mother's house. And she's not dead. She's very clearly alive. It's her husband who died. Specifically, she is in prison. They're holding her currently for questioning as they try to figure out if she murdered her husband or not. 